Hello, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. This is going to be, actually, this is part four, probably the conclusion. I did part one of separation and segregation of God's people. Then we had Ezekiel 14, Amos 3, and now turn your King James Bibles to the book of Nehemiah and chapter 9. As I've mentioned before, most demon nominational preachers will not touch this material with a 10-foot theological pole. But me, eh, I'm not dependent upon a church congregation to support me. I work with my own hands. So, hey, I'm not afraid to do controversial stuff, and I'll continue to do it until YouTube boots me off their cloud. So, Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah was the king of Jerusalem when Judah came out of the Babylonian, 70-year Babylonian captivity. Now, the Jews brought... This is where the Talmud was created, was in Babylon. Babylon was the probably the greatest world empire the world had ever seen. All right, let's take a quick look real quick at uh, the book of 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim, he was a king of Judah, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees, and bands of the Syrians, and bands of the Moabites, and bands of the children of Ammon, and sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did. Manasseh was a really wicked, evil king, and the Lord had had enough. Uh, to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicle of the Kings of Judah? Now, for those of you that wonder why these books are not in the Bible, you know, like the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah and the book of Jubilees and you know, I kind of wonder if they're, I kind of believe Jubilees is, is history, but is it scripture? I don't think so. You know, there's a lot of people running around will tell you that, you know, those books belong in the Bible and the Catholic Church removed them and this and that and the other. And I, I don't know. I, I just don't believe that. I'm not crazy about the book of Esther, but, you know, God said he would curse he would remove those names from the book of life of any that removed God's words. So I'm not willing to take a chance and remove the book of Esther from the Bible. So um, I'm not crazy about the book of Esther. I've read it one time and one time only, and I probably will never read it again. I just don't find anything worth reading in it. But, um, you know, what can I tell you? But the book of Jubilees, I do believe that's history. And it's worth reading. It really is. All right. So, now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Je Judah? So Jehoiakim slept with his fathers. That means he died. And Jehoiachin, whatever, his son reigned in his stead. And the king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land, for the king of Babylon had taken from the river of Egypt under the river Euphrates all that pertained to the king of Egypt. 
Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months, and his mother's name was Nehushuta, the daughter of El Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. Uh, let's see. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. And the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign, and he carried out thence all the treasures the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon king of Israel had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort of the people of the land. So, you know, basically, um, he took he took everybody. You know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar took 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 Jerusalem captive, just like the Lord said for seventy years. You can read about it in Jeremiah, and then you can read the Book of Daniel if you want more background on this. All right, so let's go. So after seventy years were accomplished. Um, the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, conquered Babylon, and they let Judah go back to Jerusalem. Now, if you don't know it, modern-day Persia is Iran. So if uh, the Iran was nice to the so-called Jews, why did the Jews always want us to attack them? You know? Good question. Now here's uh, interesting verses about Babylon. In Isaiah 13, and verse 9, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaiah 14 and verse 4. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Now here's another thing. Isaiah 21 and verse 9. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. Don't we read that in the New Testament? Let's take a look. Yep, in Revelation 18 and verse 2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Same language. Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. Twice. Maybe, you know, once was physical Babylon, and then the second is spiritual Babylon. Now listen to this. In Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 7, Babylon hath been a golden cup, a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. And then in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, 
and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So the Bible tells you Babylon's the golden cup. And then in Revelation, it says the woman had a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Remember, uh, Babylon was full of wickedness and false doctrine and Satan worship. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar even set up a golden statute of himself and had the people worship it. Remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? The three Hebrew children that were cast into the fire because they wouldn't worship the statue of Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, yeah. So, you know, tie this into the... Uh, the end times... If you want to understand the Bible and the end times, you got to understand history, the times of old. All right, so let's start taking a look. God punished Israel, well, Judah, for 70 years for their wickedness. The Persians conquer Babylon, and uh, what was it? Darius and Cyrus uh, allowed Judah to return back to Jerusalem and even gave them um, everything that Babylon, pretty much gave them everything that Babylon had stolen, all the gold and silver for the temple, and let them return with it. So, but they had a problem. And here's the problem. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 1. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, and with sackcloth, sackcloth, and earth upon them. These people were wearing sackcloth and dust and fasting. That is a sign of repentance. I wish America would learn and Europe would learn this lesson, but they won't. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. See, Israel was to be a separated people. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day and another fourth part of the day they confessed and worshipped the Lord, their God. All right. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 28. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethinims, and all they that had separated themselves... And all they that had separated themselves, ooh, haven't we always been told, oh, segregation is horrible. Matter of fact, uh, they had riots in the 60s, early 60s, because segregation. And you had people like Martin Lucifer King, who uh, I never heard him mention Jesus in a speech. And yet he's supposed to be some kind of a pastor or something. I don't know, pastor of what? He uh, he says, oh, we got to break down those walls. Well, guess what? God put those walls up. He put the blacks in Africa. He put the Euro whites in Europe. And he put the Asians in Asia. And all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse 
and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his judgments and his statutes. Mm. Now, go to Nehemiah chapter 13. Verse 1. On the day, on that day, they read in the book of Moses and in the audience of the people, wherein was found written, that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Now, if you don't know who the Ammonites and the Moabites were, they were the children of Lot from the incestuous relationship when his daughters got him drunk and I guess he was laying down drunk and they got on top of him. Um, he didn't know. I know there's people that will tell you that, you know, he was part of it, but it says they got him drunk and he, you know. But the thing is, I don't necessarily think the Moabites and the Ammonite, Moab and Ammon, were necessarily evil from the incestuous relationship. I think they went, the daughters went and took their kids, and the kids probably intermarried with the Canaanites, who were related to the, um, what happened in Genesis 6. And I've got an entire playlist, if you don't understand that, who were the sons of God, Genesis 6. If you want to know why God destroyed the earth and the flood, and why God told Israel to wipe out the Canaanites, kill everything that breatheth, that's why, people. But I think the Ammonites and the Moabites intermarried with the uh, satanic seed line. Now, I know in the book of Ruth, they'll tell you, well, Ruth was was a Moabite. Well, was she a Moabite by genetics or was she a Moabite by where she lived? Is there an American race? You know? Or is it just a geographical location of where you live? It used to be, if you were German, you were, you know, well, a lot of them were blonde-haired and blue-eyed and they were born in Germany and they spoke German. Now you got a boatloads of Muslims living there. You know, so they call them Germans. So what is, you know, is it a race or was it a genetics or a geographical place? Personally, I think Ruth was an Israelite, probably of divorced Israel, that lived in the land of Moab. And she's called a Moabite. I mean, let's face it. Jesus was called a Nazarene. He was called a Jew. And he was called a Galilean. Well, Galilee was not in Judah. So, where was Jesus? What was Jesus? Was he a Galilean? Was he a, a, a Nazarene? A Nazarite? Nazarene, or was he of Judah, a Jew? Well, guess what? He lived in Galilee. But he was of the tribe of Judah. So, but it says that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. I believe that they intermarried with the satanic seed line. Verse 2. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Ooh. Now it came to pass when they heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude, that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Doesn't sound like God wants us to be mixed. And what is the, um, what are they doing? They're mixing us all up in Europe, flooding us with heathen aliens, or flooding us with heathen aliens in the United States. 
They want everybody all mixed up, right? Oh, diversity is our strength. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches separation and segregation. Verse 4, And before this, Eli Shib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied unto Tobiah. Hmm. All right. Well, let's take a look at Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sin, but your iniquities, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue have muttered perverseness. Now, a little point of history. <clears throat> Prior to Judah being carried off to captivity. Uh, Northern Israel was carried into captivity by the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire would not let their captives speak their native language. And they removed them from the land. So if they conquered Florida and, let's say, Georgia... They would take the people from Georgia and move them to Florida and then take the people from Florida and move them to Georgia. And you were to speak only the Assyrian language. So, I mean, they were, they were cruel. They were really bad news, the Assyrians. So, when Babylon took over the area and the Assyrian Empire collapsed, because, you know, basically their army was sent to fight against the Babylonians because the Babylonians were expanding. Um, their army collapsed. I mean, you know, and the, the people of Israel, northern Israel, not Judah, they decided, um, you know, what are we doing here? Let's get out of here while we got a chance, you know, because they didn't have soldiers guarding them anymore. So they took off, and they t they went kind of north, a lot of them. Now, this is history. It's not in the Bible. So Israel went north into a place called the Caucasus Mountains. That's where the term Caucasian comes from. And when Israel, northern Israel, disappears from history... The Caucasians and the Europeans appear in history. So when Israel vanishes from history, the Europeans and the whites, the Caucasians, appear. Coincidence? Hmm. So let's see. Israel disappears, the whites and Caucasians and the Europeans appear. Hmm. And if you want, you can uh, E. Raymond Capt, C-A-P-T. He does some excellent research on this. Um, I had a book from the 1890s that was on the migrations of Israel. They went to Europe, people. They went to Europe. You know, and, and it's amazing how the um, Zionist-worshipping churches will fight this information. They'll call it heresy. And you start telling people this stuff in church, and you will be booted out because you will worship at the altar of the synagogue of Satan or you will be booted out. I mean, that's just basically the way it is with most churches anyways. So, God wants separation and segregation, right? All right, let's go to the book of 
New Testament, Matthew, chapter 13. Verse, Matthew, chapter 13, verse 47. Jesus speaking. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast, cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever, sever the wicked from among the just. Do you know what sever means? It means to separate. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hmm. Matthew 25, verse 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, Holy angels, remember? There's unholy angels too. Just like when um, the Bible talked about holy seed, there's also unholy seed. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. And he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Isn't that funny? The, um, the news media, the liberal antichrist media, kosher news media always calls Bible believers right-wingers and and the liberal media always says they're the left. Yeah. So God's going to put the sheep on his right and he's going to put the goats on the left. Well, I'm here to feed the sheep. I'm not here to entertain the goats. I heard that from somebody. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's Israel, people. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us Separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And you know, there are people that will tell you that this doesn't belong in the Bible because it was written by Paul. When you hear people like that, tell them to go to hell. Because that's probably their destination, because they're probably they're probably of their father, the devil. Yeah, I don't have much compassion for those kind of people. I really don't. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Concord is like a, an agreement. And Belial is just another uh, a god of like Satan. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Hmm. All right, we're going to read Revelation chapter 18 again, starting in verse, let's see, I guess one. All right, Revelation 18, chapter 18 and verse one. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. Separate yourselves. Segregate yourselves. Get out of there. Saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Still think we should be singing Michael Jackson's song, We Are the World, We Are the Children. God just loves everybody. Really? God loves everybody, huh? God loves everybody, right? Malachi chapter 1. The Old Testament, the Minor Prophets. Verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. Malachi. The burden. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. The Bible says a man's heritage is his children. Esau married into the satanic seed line, the Canaanites, or the Hittites, I, I forget which, but he, he married into that line. And, of course, the black Hebrews will are happy to tell us that white people are the children of Esau. And they'll say, oh, yo, Esau, it means red, reddish. 
Well, let's take a look at something. All right, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28. Anybody that tries to interpret the New Testament using the New Testament without a knowledge of the Old Testament is pretty much, I don't know, in my opinion, a fool. I mean, can you find salvation with just the New Testament alone? Absolutely, if you're one of God's sheep. But you'll never be a soldier. Genesis 28 and verse 1. Now, before we start reading, just remember something. God made his promise, covenant promises to Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael, who many say are the father of the Arabs, who was not to be the promised seed. And then he had another son called Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. And we read what God thought about Esau. He hated Esau because he married Canaanites. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. If you don't know this stuff, you need to read the Bible. Turn off the TV. Genesis 28, verse 1. Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanarim, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed, which is children, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. Now, when, when they're talking about a, a seed of a man, they're talking about um, children, okay? We're not fruit trees, okay? I'm not an apple tree. So when it's talking about seed, we're not talking about apple seeds. Sorry. Matter of fact, the word seed in the New Testament, do you know what the word is in the Greek? Sperma. S-P-E-R-M-A. Sperm. That's where we get the term sperm from. Believe it or not. You know, I tell you, the more you study this stuff, the more the Bible makes sense. Um, let's see. Uh, verse 4. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land, wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram, unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Um... Oh, I guess we're going to read this, because this is kind of relevant with what's going on today, why the Muslims are flooding the land. Verse 6. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Well, Esau had already done what his father didn't like. Okay, verse 7. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, well, sorry Esau, you'd already done the dirty deed. Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had Mahalalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebath Joth to be his wife. I'm slaughtering these names, I'm sure. So, Esau intermarried with Ishmael, who the Arabs claimed descent from. Don't be surprised if the Saudi royal family are the children of Ishmael and Esau. 
Don't be surprised. All right, Laban. Um, so Jacob is going to marry some close family of Laban. Okay. What does Laban mean? L-A-B-A-N in Hebrew. It means white. It's Strong's Hebrew word 3837. It means white. The Syrian, if you go to Assyria today, those people look white. I mean, you know, Laban means white. I mean, come on, people. Where do the black Hebrews get this stuff? They, I don't know. They, they got two verses that says, you know, look at me, I'm black. Well, is it talking about their, their bushy hair or a white guy that's been in the sun too long? I, I just don't get it. But they just love to want to say, well, we're going to kill all you whiteies. We're going to kill Esau. That's the, the love. You know, Jesus said, love thy neighbor. The black Hebrews say, kill him. So, I don't know. All right. And um, we're going to do a little history here. We're going to read a little bit about Babylon. Okay? So, if you're not interested in a little history of Babylon, this would be a good place for you to stop. According to... Bab, I got this from Wikipedia. Wikipedia. In 1983, Saddam Hussein began rebuilding the city of Babylon on top of the old ruins. Consequently, artifacts and other finds may be under the city. Hussein invested in both restoration and new construction in Babylon, as well as Nineveh, Nimrud, Ashur, and Hatra to demonstrate the, the magnificent of Arab achievement. He installed a portrait of himself and Nebuchadnezzar at the entrance to the ruins, and reinforced the processional way, a large boulevard of ancient stones, and the Lion of Babylon, a black rock sculpture about 2,600 years old. Hussein inscribed his name on many of the bricks in imitation of Nebuchadnezzar. One inscription reads, This was built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar, to glorify Iraq. These bricks became sought after as collector's items after Saddam's downfall. When the Gulf War ended, Saddam wanted to build a modern palace called Saddam Hill over some of the old ruins in the pyramid style of a Sumerian ziggurat. That's like uh, those pyramids that you see down in South America and, uh, you know, Egypt and what have you. Um, a ziggurat is a little bit different than a pyramid. And by the way, there are pyramids built all over the world. The largest one is in China. You didn't know that, did you? I didn't either until doing research on this kind of stuff. But they got pyramids, uh, the Aztecs, the Incans, the Mayans, they all built pyramids type things. So, um, let's see. He intended, uh, all right. Well, the plans were stopped in 2003 uh, when the United States reinvaded um, Iraq. Okay. And uh, let's read some more stuff here. All right. Um, in present-day Iraq, uh, Wikipedia says, Following the invasion of Iraq, the area around Babylon came under the control of U.S. troops before being handed over to Polish forces in September 2003. U.S. forces under the command of General James T. Conway of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force was criticized for building the military base Camp Alpha with a helipad and other facilities on ancient Babylonian ruins following the Iraq War. U.S. forces have occupied the site for some time and have caused irreputable damage to the archaeological record. In a report of the British Museum's Near East Department, Dr. John Curtis describing how parts of the archaeological site were leveled to create a landing area for helicopters and parking lots for heavy vehicles, that's tanks, Curtis wrote, 
that the uh, occupational forces, us, the United States, caused substantial damage to the Ishtar Gate, one of the most famous monuments from iniquity. U.S. military vehicles, think tanks, 60-ton tanks, crushed 2,600-year-old brick, uh, brick pavements. Archaeological fragments were scattered across the site. And um, let's see. More than 12 trenches were driven into ancient deposits and military earth-moving projects contaminated the site for future generations of scientists. A U.S. military spokesman claimed that engineering operations were discussed with the head of the Babylon Museum, the head of the Iraqi State Board for Heritage and Antiquities, Donnie George, said that the mess will take decades to sort out, and criticized Polish troops for causing terrible damage to the site. In 2005, the site was handed over to the Iraqi Ministry of Culture. Um, so, basically, the United States destroyed a lot of the stuff in Babylon. And why am I bringing this up? Well, simple. They caused a lot of damage because, in my opinion, they don't want archaeologists to dig down and find proof that the Bible was true. They don't want things mentioning Daniel and the children of the Hebrews and Judah. I think that's why they destroyed it. But that's just my opinion. We won't know until the Lord returns and everything is brought out into the open. So, all right, well, does the Bible teach separation and segregation? I think so. Um, but you know what? In 1964, the federal government said, nope, no more separation and segregation. Uh, and I'll tell you what. Take a look at all the cities like Detroit, Washington, D.C., Chicago, that are full of non-whites. I mean, they Chicago last year had 762 murders. You know, you go live in a city or town, you know, with 12, 10,000 people that's 98% white. There's almost no crime. You know? The, the evil, wicked people, they're, they're the ones flooding our land with all these heathen aliens. You think the Lord's pleased that we have centers of witchcraft called Kabbalah in the United States? We have, uh, you know, Hindu temples. Uh, you know, the Lord's not happy with this stuff, believe me. He's not. When they said freedom of religion, this is not what the, the, the creators of the United States Constitution were thinking about. Do you know that the American Bible Society was created by an act of Congress to print Bibles? The U.S. Congress created the American Bible Society. They took money from the government and printed Bibles. Oh, yeah. They didn't print Kabbalah or Talmuds or the, the, um, the Quran. So, what can I tell you? This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Stay Try to stay separated, people. It's getting real. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.